Hello everyone and welcome to the Imperial Lates Online Publis Quiz Animal Edition. Uh, Imperial Lates Online is our uh, event series for adults that explores research happening at Imperial College London. Across the week we've been exploring a theme with our very own researchers and this week has been all about wildlife. But this is the purely animal edition quiz. My name is Maeve and I work in the public engagement team at Imperial and tonight I will be your quiz master. Now we're joined tonight by Imperial researcher Ben Chappell who studies the ecology of African wild dogs and how they are affected positively and negatively by climate change and tourism. More from him later on. We'll see you later, Ben. Now I will add my beautiful slideshow that I have made and I will talk you through how the quiz is going to work. So, you will need a pen and paper. You'll be marking the rounds yourselves uh, and it's best to keep a, a record of this as you go. So there's gonna be four rounds tonight. We've got round one, which is gonna be general knowledge. Round two will be our re researcher round, which Ben will lead us through. Then we'll have a quick 10 minute Q&A with Ben. We'll have round three, which is the wild card round. Ooh. Then we're gonna give you a link in the YouTube chat where you will click and submit your scores. So those are the ones that you'll have been collecting for rounds one, two, and three. And then you will use that form that we send you a link to, to do the speed round. So there's 10 marks for each round, but I have to alert you, there is a bonus point available. If you can tell me at the end how many pictures of my dog Rihanna you have seen pop up sneakily throughout the quiz, then you get an extra bonus point. And just to be clear, this photograph, this is number one. So number one has occurred. Now I have some rules. I need you to pick a team name so that when we ask for your scores, you put that in and then we can mark you at the very end. Otherwise, how are we gonna know who's won? Please don't put any correct answers in the chat. That ruins it for everybody. Use your pen and paper to write down your answer and you mark it from there. No cheating because there's no point. Uh, no inappropriate or disruptive use of the chat. Let's keep it cool, guys. No arguing with the quiz master, that's me. I have done my research on these questions and my answer is final. <laughs> and do get involved. So we want you to ask questions to our researcher, Ben. Uh, as I said, his expertise is in African wild dogs and ecology and tourism. So if you've got anything that you want to ask him, just stick it in the chat and my lovely colleague Ellie will pass them on to me to ask Ben later. And once we've marked the rounds, then you can put your answers in the chat if they're silly and you know you just want to share them with people. If we're having any problems, uh, my other colleague, Emma, the superstar, will put this slide up and say, sorry, we're having some technical issues, but just grab a drink and I'll be back with you. So if you are all ready, uh, let us begin with the quiz. So round one, there's 10 questions. Here we go. Question one. We're going to start with one of my favorite animal films, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. What is the formation of the three main animals in the film? Is it A, dog, dog, cat? Is it B, dog, dog, dog? Or is it C, dog, cat, cat? So that's question one again. We're gonna start with one of my favorite animal films, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. What is the formation of the three main animals in the film? Is it A, dog, dog, cat? Is it B, dog, dog, dog? Or is it C, dog, cat, cat? Okay, question two, staying with domestic animals. What breed of dog is the only one that can't bark? So 
So that's question two, staying with our domestic animals. What breed of dog is the only one that can't bark? Okay, question three. So I know that I mentioned dogs, but here's for the cat lovers. Why is Stubbs the cat famous? A, he was the first cat who went to space. Is it B, he was the mayor of a small town? Or is it C, he holds the record for oldest cat who ever lived? That's question three again. Why is Stubbs the cat famous? Is it A, he was the first cat who went to space? Is it B, he was the mayor of a small town? Or is it C, he holds the record for oldest cat who ever lived? Okay, question four. Did you know that the name hippopotamus comes from two Greek words? Potamus means river. But what does hippo mean? Is it A, camel, B, e, deer, or C, horse? So question four again, did you know that the name hippopotamus comes from two Greek words? Potamus means river, but what does hippo mean? Is it A, camel, B, deer, or C, horse? Okay, question five, got some pictures for you here. I want to know which of these beautiful cats is a jaguar. And I'll give you a hint, there is a difference in their fur coats. So is it A or B? So I want to know which of these beautiful cats is a jaguar. Got A on the left or B on the right? Hmm. Okay, moving on to question six now. Which of these actors was a lion tamer in the circus before making it in Hollywood? A, Christopher Walken, B, Danny DeVito, or C, Pierce Brosnan? It's worth noting that all three of these actors had weird jobs before they made it in Hollywood, but I wanna know which one was a lion tamer in the circus. Was it A, Christopher Walken, B, Danny DeVito, or C, Pierce Brosnan? Okay, question seven. Coco, the Western lowland gorilla, was famous for her ability to communicate in sign language. What is she saying here? 
And she's saying A, please, B, sorry, or C, thank you. So I hope you have someone in your team who knows sign language. If not, I've made it easier for you by giving you multiple choice. So that's question seven. Coco, the Western lowland gorilla, was famous for her ability to communicate in sign language. What is she saying here? And I apologize for the slightly blurry photo. It's the only one I could get. Is she saying A, please, B, sorry, or C, thank you? Okay, question eight. No multiple choice here. I'm just going to ask you straight out. What is a group of alligators called? So that's question eight. What is a group of alligators called? And so I'm now just noticing that you can see the beautiful uh, dusk light coming through my windows. <laughs> And just a reminder that we don't want any correct answers in the chat or even incorrect answers at this point. So keep them to yourselves, write them down on your piece of paper or if you're keeping a little note on your phone or uh, in a Word document, keep them to yourselves. Uh, we're gonna do the answers after this round is finished. So you don't have to wait too long. Wow, it's very sunny. Which is the best way? I'm gonna lean here. Okay, question nine. In the film Jurassic Park, the makers obviously couldn't use authentic dinosaur sounds. What did they use instead to make the growls of the iconic velociraptors? A, donkeys braying. B, foxes fighting. Or C, tortoises mating. That's question nine. In the film Jurassic Park, the makers obviously couldn't use authentic dinosaur sounds. So what did they use instead to make the growls of the iconic velociraptors? Is it A, donkeys braying, B, foxes fighting, or C, tortoises mating? And if you're having a debate with your teammates, uh, I will give you two minutes after I've read question 10 to decide what you think your answer is. Okay, last question of the round for the music people out there. Question 10, this is the opening of a famous piece of music by Rimsky-Korsakov. What is it called? The A, Dash of the Ant, is it B, flight of the bumblebee? Or is it C, zip of the fly? So final question of the round, question 10. This is the opening of a famous piece of music by Rimsky-Korsakov. What is it called? Is it A, dash of the ant? B, flight of the bumblebee? Or C, zip of the fly. Okay, so everyone keep your answers to yourselves. I'm gonna give you two minutes now to discuss amongst you and finalize those answers. So when I come back in two minutes, we're gonna do all the answers for round one. So I will see you shortly.
Hi everyone. Okay, that is the end of round one. Um, just to remind you all that you are self-marking, so I'm going to give you all the answers now to round one. Once you've got all your answers, tick them right or wrong. There's one point for each one, and then if you just keep a track of what you've got for each round, and after round three, we're going to give you a link to a form where you put your scores in, so just hang on to those. Okay, so let's see what we got. So in the first question, I asked you, uh, what is the formation of the three main animals in the film? And it is dog, dog, cat. These are the beautiful animals here. Um, this is such a wonderful film, in my opinion. Uh, so on the very left, you've got Chance. He's an American bulldog. In the middle is the ever faithful a golden retriever named Shadow. And then uh, we've got Sassy, the Himalayan cat on the far right. So that's A. So give yourself a point if you got that right. Dog, dog, cat. Okay, question two. I asked you which uh, dog is the only one that can't bark? See if you got this one. It's a Basengi dog. So no, it can't bark, but it's not completely silent either. It can make a wide variety of other kinds of noises, but it's well known for its unique yodeling sound. It is interesting to look that up, find one on YouTube, or if you have any, you know anyone who has a Basengi. So that's a Basengi, one point if you got that right. Okay, question three for the cat lovers. I asked you why Stubbs the cat was famous, and it is because he was the mayor of a small town in Alaska. So he's an orange tabby cat called Stubbs, and he was the mayor of Talkeetna. Uh, here he is. Uh, so he was mayor for a small town in Alaska for 20 years. He had several uncontested elections, and although he didn't hold any legislative power, he was loved by locals and tourists alike. Um, there are cats who have done those other things that I mentioned. So uh, in 1963, Felicette was um, Astro Cat, which was the first cat to go to space. And the oldest cat ever to have lived holds the record since 2005. Uh, that was Cream Puff, who was 38 years and three days old. But for this question, I'm looking for B, Mayor of Small Town. Okay, uh, I then asked you, what does the word hippo stand for? So this actually means horse. So if, uh, if you are saying, oh, look at that hippo, that's actually wrong. You're saying, look at that horse. So you are required to say hippopotamus, meaning river horse, uh, if you're going to be absolutely correct. This is one of my favorite pieces of animal trivia. So C, horse, give yourself a point. Okay, now did you identify which one of these beautiful cats is a jaguar? So I can tell you that it is A. So this one um, has little dots in their rosette. So you can see I've got a little image there. So that is the jaguar. The one on the right is a leopard. So you can see that it's just clear in those little rosettes. Um, jaguars live in Central and South America where they are the largest big cats while leopards are the smallest big cats in Africa and Asia. 
So jaguars are, are bigger and bulkier. They can weigh up to 250 pounds, whereas a leopard uh, weighs around 175 pounds. So I was looking for A is the right answer. Okay, um, which actor was a lion tamer in the circus? It was Christopher Walken. So A, Christopher Walken. Um, give yourself a point if you got that right. So as a teenager, this beautiful specimen man, Walken, worked a number of seasonal jobs in order to earn extra money. And one of these, when he was 16, was a lion tamer in the circus. So I did say that all of the other actors had some interesting jobs as well. So uh, Danny DeVito, uh, he was a hairdresser for corpses. So he would style uh, women's hair uh, before they were buried. And Pierce Brosnan was also in the circus. He was a professional fire eater. So that picture there uh, is him performing his old skill on a, a Muppets uh, special. Okay, I wanted to know what um, Coco the gorilla was saying here. Uh, she was saying sorry. So this is sorry uh, in sign language. Uh, please is open palm and thank you is thank you. So uh, if you got that right, give yourself a point. B for sorry. Then I asked you what was a group of alligators called? So we're on question eight now and a group of alligators is called a congregation. Um, which definitely doesn't make it sound as scary as it definitely would be if you saw a congregation of alligators. So congregation is the right answer. One point for that. Okay, question nine. I want to know what was used to make the growls of the velociraptors. It was tortoises mating. So they were actually these sounds uh, because it would have been impossible to make legit dinosaur Sound. So they went with the, the next best thing. They did use other sounds for different dinosaur noises. They used um, uh, horses squealing with excitement and also the bark of a Jack Russell dog. So the answer to that is C. Give yourself a point if you got that right. And finally, uh, I want to know what the name of this piece of music was. Um, so you didn't need to be a music expert to know this, but you'll be very pleased with yourself if you did know that it is Flight of the Bumblebee. Uh, it's an amazing piece of music and it's super fast. Um, so highly recommend that you check that out. <laughs> okay, so keep a note of how many you got out of 10 for that. We will ask you for that later. But for now, we're going into round two. So let's bring back our lovely researcher, Ben. How you doing, Ben? Hi, very well, thank you, babe. How are you doing? Yeah, it's not too bad. I think it's going rather well. Um, would you like to tell uh, our audience a bit about who you are? Sure, yeah. So um, I am a PhD student here at Imperial. Um, and as Maeve mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I mostly study African wild dogs, um, partly because they are just wonderful, fascinating animals in their own right, um, but also because they make a really interesting case study to look at the impact of tourism and climate change. Um, so they are both peculiarly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, it seems, but also highly dependent on international tourism to fund the conservation of the landscapes that they need to survive. So if you're flying halfway around the world to look for wild dogs, you are both contributing to their conservation by funding programs as a result of your visit, um, but also contributing to climate change through the carbon emissions involved in long haul air travel, um, and that climate change might be increasing the extinction risk for that species. So it makes a really interesting case study trying, under, trying to understand what the role of tourism should be in the future in supporting conservation in the context of sort of shrinking carbon budgets and the effects of climate change on biodiversity more generally. Yeah, man, that's super, uh, super difficult uh, sort of thing to, to look at. So if anyone has any questions uh, after we finish this round with Ben, we'll have 10 minutes where you can ask him anything you like. So if you post those into the YouTube chat and uh, my colleague Ellie will send them through to me and I will put them to Ben. Um, so before we kick off the round, I just wanted to show you uh, this picture, which is uh, of two African wild dogs. So uh, all of the pictures that are African wild dogs in this round that I'm going to show you were taken by Ben. Is that right? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So he is truly our expert. He's been up close and personal. Um, so you will see some of these pictures. So uh, be amazed as we go through it. So I'm going to stick around here and be your cheerleader, Ben. But this round is all yours, so take it away. 
Thank you very much, Maeve. OK, so we'll get straight into question one. The African wild dog is the second most endangered large carnivore in Africa. But what is the most endangered? Is it A, the cheetah, B, the brown hyena, or C, the Ethiopian wolf? Um, so that's the, the African wild dog is the second most endangered large carnivore in Africa. But what is the most endangered? Is it A, the cheetah, B, the brown hyena, or C, the Ethiopian wolf? Moving on to question two. So African wild dogs were once found across most of sub-Saharan Africa, but they have sadly disappeared from much of their former range. Which of these countries is no longer home to the species? Is it A, Ghana, B, Senegal, or C, the Central African Republic? So which of the countries on this list is no longer home to African wild dogs? Is it A, Ghana, B, Senegal, or C, the Central African Republic? OK, question three. The African wild dog has many competing alternative names. Which of the following is not one of them? A, painted wolf. B, cape hunting dog. Or C, bat eared dog. So which of the names on this list has not been used to refer to the African wild dog? Is it A, painted wolf? B, cape hunting dog, or C, bat-eared dog? While everyone's thinking about that, I've just been informed that we had a pretty good answer for the alligator question. Someone is asking if they get a bonus point for a see you later of alligators. Uh, I'm afraid I can't give you a bonus point, uh, but kudos to you for being so, so cool and funny. Can we offer a bonus point for a good collective noun for wild dogs, maybe? Not sure. Ooh. Mm, it's a challenge, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question four then. Uh, wild dogs are, are fascinating creatures. Um, if, you, if you haven't heard of them before, you might have to take my word on that, but um, I promise you they are. Um, but many safaris are more likely to focus on the so called big five. Uh, which of these is the correct lineup for the big five? Is it A, buffalo, elephant, leopard, lion, rhino? B, elephant, giraffe, hippopotamus, lion, rhino? Or C, elephant, rhino, hippopotamus, lion, cheetah? So which, which of these sets of five is the correct lineup for the famous big five uh, of Africa? Is it A, buffalo, elephant, leopard, lion, rhino? B, elephant, giraffe, hippopotamus, lion, rhino? Or C, elephant, rhino, hippopotamus, lion, cheetah? I'm very pleased, Ben, that you're using the correct hippopotamus <laughs> Uh, name and not just hippo because that would just be a horse. I'll just leave those up for a second so people can have a little read. Okay, moving on to question five then. Uh, sticking with the big five, uh, the term uh, the term Big Five long predates the modern wildlife tourism industry. What did the term Big Five orig originally refer to? Was it A, the five animals most damaging to colonial agriculture? B, the five most sought after species for European zoos? Or C, the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot? 
So I'll say that again. Uh, which of these was originally uh, was the original designation for the term the Big Five? Um, what did the term the Big Five originally refer to? Was it A, the five animals most damaging to colonial agriculture? B, the five most sought after species for European zoos? Or C, the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot? Okay, question six. Wild dogs are highly social creatures and packs even employ a voting system to decide when to set off on a hunt. But by what means do the dogs cast their votes? Is it A, by barking, B, by farting, or C, by sneezing? So wild dogs, um, just are fantastically social creatures uh, and they're even slightly democratic. They employ a voting system to decide when to go off on a hunt, uh, but by what means do they cast those votes? Uh, is it A, by barking, B, by farting, or C, by sneezing? All right then, question seven. Wild dogs are often described as being cursorial predators, but what does cursorial mean? Is it A, that each pack tends to specialise on a particular prey species? Or B, they chase their prey down over long distances? Or C, they never scavenge, always hunting their own food? So wild dogs are often described as being cursorial predators, uh, but what does this term cursorial mean? Is it A, that each pack tends to specialise on a particular prey species? B, that they chase their prey down over long distances? Or C, they never scavenge, always hunting their own food? That's a great comment from uh, Philip Stevens there, Ben. Is the voting system first, pa first past the post or is it proportional representation, maybe? <laughs> well, maybe we, can, maybe we can go into that a little bit later. It will come up with the answer. <laughs> great question. Leave that for the Q&A. <laughs> so question eight. Uh, unlike grey wolves, uh, wild dogs lack a rigid hierarchical pack structure. Uh, and it's the youngest pack members who are usually allowed to eat first. Uh, until what age do the pups get priority? Is it A, until they're six months old, B, until they're a year old, or C, until they are two years old? So this is a question about how long it is um, for the beginning of their lives that wild dog pups are allowed to eat first at kills by the adults. Um, so is that until they are six months old, until they are a year old, or until they are two years old. That is a super, super cute picture of uh, a pup <laughs> pen. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, this was actually, this is the first time I ever saw wild dogs uh, in oh. Northern Botswana back in 2009, so a long, long time ago now. Uh, oh. We're very, very lucky to spend a couple of days at, at a den site. Um, where they, these pups had just come out of the, of the den a couple of days earlier. So in, incredibly privileged to, to see them at that age because they, in lots of parts of Africa, they, they den in very inaccessible locations. Uh, they mm -hmm. can be very hard to track down. Uh, definitely something I've yeah, uh, stuck, really stuck with me and, and helped mm -hmm. put me on the path I've, I've sort of come on uh, to this day. Yeah, what a brave little pup. <laughs> <laughs> So moving on to question nine then, uh, wild dogs frequently suffer from kleptoparasitism. What does this mean? A, other predators often steal their food. B, 
B, parasites spread quickly between pack members. Or C, they are highly susceptible to parasite-borne infectious diseases. So I'll say that again. Uh, wild dogs frequently suffer from something called kleptoparasitism. Uh, but what is kleptoparasitism and what does it mean? Uh, A, that other predators often steal their food. B, that parasites spread quickly between pack members. Or C, uh, that they are highly susceptible to parasite-borne infectious diseases. Okay, moving on then to the final question in this round. Um, wild dogs have enormous home ranges and viable populations require vast areas of habitat. South Africa's Kruger National Park, home to several hundred individuals, is spread over nearly 20,000 square kilometres. This is approximately the same size as which UK nation? Is it A, Northern Ireland? B, Scotland, or C, Wales? So this is question number 10. The Kruger National Park is 20,000 square kilometers in size, roughly. Uh, that is approximately the same size as which UK nation? Is it A, Northern Ireland, B, Scotland, or C, Wales? OK, everyone, so I'm now going to give you another two minutes uh, with some lovely interlude music while you discuss and decide on what your answers are. And then we're going to mark the answers. So two minutes time, me and then we'll see you back here and we'll go through the answers. See you then. Okay, time's up, everybody. Um, I hope you have decided what your answers are because we're gonna go straight in to those answers and little bits of knowledge that Ben can share with us. Okay then, so in question one, um, I asked you uh, what the most endangered large carnivore in Africa was, given that African wild dog is the second most endangered large carnivore. Um, the answer was C, Ethiopian wolf. Um, so, so cheetahs are the most endangered large cat in Africa. Um, there are probably something like six or seven thousand individuals of them left. 
And, and in lots of ways, the, their conservation requirements are quite similar to those of African wild dogs. In, in particular, they need large areas of relatively undisturbed, uh, undisturbed habitat. Um, the brown hyena is the rarest species of hyena in the world, um, and its distribution is mostly centered around the Kalahari Desert in uh, southern Africa. Um, but then the Ethiopian wolf, um, just a few hundred individuals of this species left in the wild, all in sort of scattered pockets around the highlands of Ethiopia. Um, and one of the biggest threats to them nowadays is infectious disease, um, which is also um, a big threat to African wild dogs, um, things like canine distemper virus and rabies. Um, although the biggest reason for wild dogs historical decline has been um, a loss of habitat you know, going back going back centuries. Oh. Okay, uh, in question two, um, I asked you uh, which of these three countries uh, is no longer home to African wild dogs in the wild and the answer was A, Ghana. So sadly, Wild dogs really have disappeared from a pretty huge proportion of their original range. Um, Ghana is a country in West Africa that is no longer home to them. Um, in West Africa, Senegal is pretty much the only country that, that definitely has reasonable numbers of wild dogs left. Um, and there are still some that cling on in the Central African Republic as well. Um, most of the species remaining strongholds are in Southern Africa, um, with some around the sort of southern end of East Africa, particularly around the Salu Game Reserve in Tanzania, um, and their other big stronghold really in Africa is across northern Botswana, stretching into um, eastern Namibia and western Zimbabwe. Just a reminder, our audience, if there's anything here that is sparking a question, um, do put it in the chat because we'll come to uh, putting those to Ben just after we've done the answers to this round. Okay, in question three, I asked you which of these names has not been given to the African wild dog as an alternative name? And the answer was C, the bat-eared dog. Um, there is a species of canid in Africa called the bat-eared fox, um, which also has enormous ears, um, like, like the African wild dog, um, but it's actually a very um, distant relative. It's one of the most primitive of all living canines. Um, wild dog, this, this question about what they should be called, I, I think for me is a really interesting one. Um, quite often when I tell people that I work on African wild dogs, um, a lot of people's first impression is that I study feral dogs. I study sort of domestic dogs that are running wild across Africa and interfering with the local wildlife rather than being an integral part of that, of that wildlife. Um, so it's, I think some people have suggested that if, we only, if it only had a better name, something like painted wolf or cape hunting dog or African painted dog, that that might help uh, generate a little bit more positive press for them, um, sort of rebranding exercise, if you will. Uh, and, and you may have seen um, the BBC's Dynasties series a few years ago, um, where they've had some amazing sequences of wild dogs um, hunting in Zimbabwe at Mana Pools National Park, and, and they called them painted wolves there. Uh, and the scientific name Lycaon pictus literally translates as painted wolf, so that's a pretty good one. But the fact of the matter is that pretty much everyone in Africa still calls them African wild dogs. Um, and I, 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 for one, would be slightly reluctant to fly in as a kind of, you know, uh, a, an English you know, scientist from London and say, tell the people who live and work there what they should or shouldn't be calling their wildlife. I think it has to be their decision. Yeah, there's some nice names, though, and they are so beautiful. Like, the African wild dog doesn't really give it uh, justice. Um, I quite like painted wolf, personally. No, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I think it's a difficult question. Uh, there needs to be some consensus because I think even with these sort of recent BBC documentaries, they've called them different things in almost every one. And so I, yeah. I worry almost about brand recognition. You know, we want people to, to know that this is one of the, the most exciting things they could be seeing. Yeah, you to get the marketing manager for uh, Coca-Cola on the, on the case. <laughs> so uh, in question four, um, I asked you what the correct lineup for the famous Big Five was. And that was A, a buffalo, elephant, leopard, lion, and rhino. Um, so uh, what's interesting for me is that for, uh, if you quiz first time safari goers to Africa, almost exclusively it's the Big Five that they most want to see, um, which to a certain extent is understandable. These are five of the most famous um, an iconic species on the continent. Uh, but if you are more experienced as a visitor, um, something that's quite encouraging from my point of view is that as you become more experienced, your um, 
desire to see wild dog goes up and up. <laughs> so the, the more you know the landscape, the more you know what's exciting to see and uh, what the most interesting animals to see are in the wild, the greater the priority that you put on African wild dog. Um, and from my own experience, I can say that's absolutely um, correct. You, know, you, can, you can sit watching lions all day and they might do nothing but sleep, as wild dogs are always doing something interesting. Yeah, and, and uh, I went to um, South Africa a few years ago, and I don't think I even ever saw a leopard. So I think if you go there uh, hoping to see maybe an African wild dog, you're going to be much more satisfied uh, with achieving your goal. I guess that they are much much more difficult to see than leopards. Um, so mm -hmm. they're probably the they're probably the well, they're certainly one of the hardest species to see out there uh, because they live at such low population densities. Um, Sneaky. Uh, so, but yes, I, I would argue that they are. You know part of their appeal lies in the fact that they are so elusive and when you do get to see them um, it, it really is a sort of highlight of any visit to Africa. Mm, good to know. Okay, uh, question five then. Um, I asked you uh, what the term Big Five originally referred to. Why was that phrase coined? Um, and that was uh, to describe the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. And so this was a term that came from 19th century big game hunters visiting Africa. Um, and out of that list, those five, so lion, uh, leopard, elephant, rhino, buffalo, it's actually buffalo that are generally thought of as being by far the most dangerous animal on that list, despite the fact that they are basically to look at just kind of cows. Um, <laughs> they, they often look pretty placid, but actually if you're out on foot, um, especially if you're kind of pestering them, they can be uh, extremely unpredictable. They yeah, they're really huge. Dangerous. Aren't they? They're like absolutely massive, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, they can weigh half a ton or so. Um, the bulls. So you, you do not want to be on the wrong end of a of a buffalo charge. Um, but uh, you know you don't want to be on the wrong end of an elephant charge either. It's just that buffalo, <laughs> <laughs> are, um, or any of the rest of them for that matter. But um, you know buffalo are just so difficult to to. It's very difficult to uh, to um, uh, predict what they're going to do. Um, one of the things I kind of worry about slightly is this idea of the big five is, is quite, you know, it has its roots in big game hunting, um, which isn't really anything to do with the kind of priorities that we should be setting as ecotourists now. I mean, those five animals are fascinating in their own right, certainly, but is a buffalo any more interesting than a hippo or a giraffe? I mean, I would argue not at all. I mean, those animals are two of the most extraordinary things you could possibly hope to see um, out on safari. And, and I, I have a slight concern that the sort of obsession with the big five, this arbitrary obsession with the big five, um, diverts some attention away from other very deserving species. And that could have sort of knock on conservation related effects. Um, that's something I'd like to look into a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so it's a good point. It's similar to um, what you were saying about the African wild, wild dogs, maybe. Uh, could uh, benefit from a rebrand. Um, the big five are those are the ones that get the most traction, and, and people say, oh, "I'm going to go and see those." So uh, it is a really good point that you're excluding all of the other amazing animals there. And uh, may, it makes sense that it's it, it come from like uh, a while ago. This name um, that makes a lot more sense to me now. So in question six, um, I asked you. Uh, how wild dogs vote when they employ this voting system before they go off to hunt. Uh, what means do they use? And that is C, sneezing. They sneeze to cast their votes. So um, uh, I, we had that comment, I can't remember who it was from, but uh, about whether it's a first past the post system. <laughs> so in, in, in general here, it's um, you need, uh, once you get a kind of quorum of around about half of the members in the pack voting, it, it, they tend to go ahead. But interestingly, not all the dogs in the pack are equal. Um, some are more equal than others. Um, and each pack is led by an alpha pair, uh, an alpha male and an alpha female. Um, and if they want to go, if they want to go out hunting, almost always the rest of the pack will have to go too, regardless of whether any of the others voted for it. Um, so they do get a say, um, but essentially at the end of the day, what the top dogs um want to do most is what happens. I'm impressed that uh, it, it seems that these dogs can sneeze on cue. They can say, I'm going to sneeze now. Uh, I certainly can't can't sneeze yeah. on cue. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I'm sure we can, there are some videos of it on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's it's a very clear exhalation um, through, the, <laughs> through the nose, um, whether it, yeah, it, it seems to be voluntary anyway. Um, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 
So question seven, excuse me, um, wild dogs are often described as cursorial predators, uh, but what does cursorial mean? Uh, and what that means is that they tend to chase their prey down over long distances. Wild dogs are adapted for uh, long distance running, um, endurance running, that the kind of stereotypical African wild dog hunt, um, which you often see on these big flagship wildlife documentaries, is them chasing down large prey um, over great big open spaces until they simply exhaust their their um, their target. Kind of a brutal way of doing it, um, but very very effective. Um, although they also um, do employ shorter chases at times as well. Um, yeah, uh, but actually, what's interesting about this hunting style, um, which is in contrast to the sort of more ambush predator type approach of things like lion and leopard, is that they run the risk, it seems, of overheating um, when they're doing these very long distance chases. And because they're already hunting during the day, or much more during the day than um, sort of nocturnal predators like lion or leopard would do, um, when temperatures are persistently higher, um, it seems to be the case that um, they are more likely to have to end chases early. Um, seems more likely that there are going to be shorter windows of time at the beginning and the end of the day where they're able to hunt successfully. Um, and that means that they are, it seems, vulnerable to the effects of climate change because if temperatures do go up on average, then they're going to be able, they're going to have less time to hunt, which will either mean that they get less food in total or might mean that they compensate by hunting more at night and if they hunt more at night, they are more likely to come into contact with lions and hyenas. Um, and those uh, interactions with those species generally don't end very well for wild dogs, sadly. <laughs> so question eight then uh, was about uh, until what age do wild dog pups get priority at kills? Or until what age are they allowed to eat first? Um, and that is until they're yearlings, so until they are a year old. Um, and this is in contrast to other species like grey wolves and like lions, where by and large, um, the order at which individuals eat at kills is determined by strength, determined by dominance. Um, wild dogs are, you know, they are wonderfully sociable creatures. Um, in the past, they did sometimes get a slightly bad rep because they have this, they seem to have this nasty habit of starting to eat their prey before it's necessarily dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which which uh, isn't to everybody's taste, um, but but within the pack they are incredibly kind to one another. So um, as I mentioned here, uh, they'll let the youngest members of the pack eat first. Um, they'll also bring back food um, to sick and injured individuals in the pack who aren't able to hunt for themselves, and they'll look after those individuals um, until um, they recover, until they're well enough to join in with the pack's activities. Um, so actually, you know, despite some sort of superficial out outward appearances, they are really endearing, really compassionate, uh, you know, very, <laughs> very wonderful sort of sociable animals. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so question nine uh, was wild dogs frequently suffer from kleptoparasitism. Uh, what does kleptoparasitism mean? Uh, and that means that, that other animals uh, often end up stealing their food. So um, if you ever see a, a pack of wild dogs hunting, if you're following a pack of wild dogs hunting, you might often see um, at least one or two hyenas, spotted hyenas, tailing them as they go along. Um, and then as soon as the dogs make a kill, um, if the hyenas feel bold enough, they feel they've got enough numbers, uh, they'll sometimes swoop in, evict the dogs from the kill uh, and take it for themselves. Um, and that, you know, because these sort of wild dog chases are so energetically costly, um, if this happens too much, um, it, can, it could potentially cause real problems for the dogs. Um, lions will steal their food occasionally too. Um, but lions, if, if lions come across wild dogs, they will do absolutely everything they can to, to kill the dogs because they see them as um, really serious competition. Uh, so, yeah, lions, lions and wild dogs don't mix very well. Poor little dogs getting their food stolen after a long <laughs> chase. OK, so the final question was, um, which of the UK nations is approximately the same size as the Kruger National Park, uh, which is 20,000 square kilometres? And that is Wales. So Wales is just over 20,000 square kilometres in size. Uh, Kruger is just under. Um, but when you add the sort of private game reserves around the western side of Kruger and the Limpopo National Park across the border in Mozambique, 
um, to the east of Kruger, um, you actually get this vast sort of trans transboundary conservation area of about 40,000 square kilometers. So it's a really spectacular landscape. Um, and as I sort of alluded to a bit earlier, um, a lot of these landscapes that still support sizable wild dog populations are highly dependent on tourism to fund at least some of the, the conservation activities that go on in those reserves. Um, and tourism is a huge, particularly wildlife tourism, is a huge contributor to the economies of lots of sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and yet, again, as I said earlier, uh, of course, long haul travel flying halfway across the world has a high carbon cost associated with it. That's contributing to climate change. Um, and a lot of these landscapes might change you know, beyond recognition in the next few decades if climate change continues uh, as predicted. And that will necessarily make them unsuitable for the species we're trying to conserve and the species that, you know, whose conservation is being funded by that tourism. Um, and so what my sort of primary research interest is, is, is trying to work out uh, what the right balance is. You know, is tourism a viable way of supporting conservation in the face of climate change? Um, if it is, um, or if it's sort of too important to lose, um, then what kinds of tourism do we need to prioritise? Uh, can we look at better, more sustainable models of tourism that are going to allow us to um, continue to have these amazing places for wildlife um, in Africa without um, causing them so much harm by visiting them that we end up sort of leading to their destruction anyway. Very tricky question. You let us know if you get the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so yeah. that is the end of uh, round two. So yeah. there was one point there for each correct answer. So make a little note of what you got out of 10 because we will be asking you for that later. Um, so now we'd love to hear how you're getting on. Uh, tell us how you're doing in the chat. Um, but for the next um, maybe five or so minutes, I'm going to uh, address some of the questions that you've been asking uh, to Ben. So, Ben, we've got a few things coming in. So, uh, Chris Daniels would like to ask, why, to my human eyes at least, do dogs appear to be much more diversified as a species than other domesticated animals such as cows, horses or sheep? Ooh, um, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that I think you know, dogs have been domesticated to, uh, well, I think you know, it's a sort of chicken and egg situation, possibly slightly, but domesticated dogs do a lot of different things for us. You know, we've bred them to be companions. We've bred them to be rabbit hunters. We've bred them to be uh, sheep dogs. We've actually bred them for such a real diversity of different functions. Um, that I think, I think you know, to a certain extent, the artificial selection that we've imposed on uh, on dogs has caused them to diversify in very different ways. Whereas perhaps those other livestock animals, those other domestic animals, have been. Um, I think that the, the uses we have for them are perhaps more limited. Um, that would be that would be my um, that would be my answer, I guess. Um, there's also some really fascinating stuff around. Um, there was an experiment that was done in, I think, in, in Soviet Russia, um, where they tried to domesticate uh, wild foxes. Um, and after a few generations of breeding these, these wild foxes for um, domestic dog type traits, um, these foxes were coming up to people in the street, wagging their tails. Um, they got floppy ears. They started getting all sorts of variable, <laughs> color, variable color patterns. Um, so there, does, there seems to be something in dogs, in sort of the canid family, where if you breed them for tameness, you, you seem to get all these other associated effects that we that we um, we think of when we think about the variety of different domestic dog breeds. Um, so there may be something just simply about their genetics that um, that uh, that contributes to the variety as well. Mm. And I have, to, I have a follow up question on that from Ben Collier, uh, who says, why are wild dogs seemingly less diverse than wild cats? Um, I, I am, so I, I don't think I would necessarily agree with that. I think, so there are about 40, roughly 40 species of wild cat. Um, and I'm actually can't remember off the top of my head exactly how many species of wild canid there are, but it's, it's definitely a sort of similar order of magnitude. If, if anything, I would, I would probably argue that wild dogs, well, sorry, wild cats were less diverse. You know, cats tend to be hyper carnivorous you know that they, they really they eat meat essentially to the exclusion of everything else so whether you're a tiny cat you know rusty spotted cat in in south asia which is the smallest species of cat in the world right up to a tiger um 
their life history strategies, their uh, behaviors in lots of ways are fairly similar. You know, they are largely ambush predators. They are, um, their social structures are fairly similar. Whereas actually I would argue that there's, there's quite a lot more diversity in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, all sorts of things to, in, in the dog family, actually, you know, everything from the sort of hypersocial um, or very, very social sort of gray wolves and wild dogs through to you know, bizarre things like maimed wolf. If you, if you haven't seen maimed wolf before, I definitely recommend sort of Googling that bizarre kind of uh, canid from South America that lives out in the, the grasslands of sort of Brazil. They basically live on stilts, um, very strange animals, and, uh, and, and, and a, a very good example of, I think, how much diversity there is in the, in the dog family. Um, I think you know, neither of these families ha are as diverse, perhaps, as um, other carnivore and families, maybe like the mustelids, you know, that's badgers, weasels, stoats, um, otters, you know, all that kind of that group. But I, I would say that I think um, cats are... Cats are less diverse um, than dogs. Mm, controversial. Uh, now, I've just uh, got one quick other one, uh, and then um, Ben's going to go into the chat and answer your other questions there. But I quite like this one. This is from uh, Joe H. If you could ask a wild dog one question and have <laughs> it answer you, what would it be and why? Oh, dear. <laughs> That's a fantastic question. Um, see, I think the problem is I, I feel like I can talk to them anyway. So I just... <laughs> the dog whisperer, are you? Yeah, yeah, I like to think so. You know, you just sort of chat at them and yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think... Um, so the, you know, some of the important questions that we're looking at at the moment, which which aren't isn't necessarily what my work focuses on so much anymore, is, is sort of why they seem to be so affected by... Um, by climate change. Um, we, it seems to be a direct physiological effect, um, but um, it, it may be that it's something else entirely. It could be it could be something to do with changes in the way they interact with their prey. So perhaps their prey behave differently when it's hot, which makes them much harder to hunt. Um, I think that would be a, a question I'd really like to answer, because if you can answer that question about why they're affected by climate change, that suddenly opens up the possibility at least that you might be able to come up with some conservation strategies that could mitigate those effects. Um, if it's a direct physiological effect, then it's it's hard because it's, it's, it's just high temperatures makes them overheat more quickly, which means they can't hunt as well. But if, if it is something to do with prey interactions, for example, you could conceivably you know, do some interventions to change the habitat structure slightly to maybe benefit wild dogs slightly more, or, or at least there might be certain things you could do. Um, so I think it would be a question like that, um, something that would inform you know, future conservation strategies for the species. That's amazing. Great answers, uh, Ben. So uh, we don't have time to look at any more on here with me asking them because I have a quiz to get on with. But Ben will be looking at the questions that, ha that I didn't put to him. So I we have seen you uh, and he'll be answering those in the chat as the quiz goes on. So thanks, Ben. And we'll, we'll see you at the end and uh, enjoy chatting to him uh, in the YouTube chat. See you in a bit. So now uh, we have round three. So this is the wild card round. And this series, I have a battle of the babies for you. So I love uh, little cute animals. And what I'm gonna ask you in this round is which one of the animals did something first? So they're born and then they learn something, but who learns it first? So we will go straight in to round three. So question one, uh, which of these is smaller when they are born? Is it a dolphin or a kangaroo? That's question one, who is smaller when they are born? Thank you, Fluffy1309. Yeah, it, Ben has many, many fascinating insights. <laughs> Okay, so who's smaller when they're born? Dolphin or a kangaroo? Question two, who learns to walk first? Is it an elephant? No. Oh. Or a giraffe? No. Oh. Look at the little faces. This round was a pleasure to put together. This is question two, who learns to walk first? Is it an elephant or a giraffe?
Okay, question three, who learns to climb first? Is it the black bear or the panda? That's question three, who learns to climb first? And don't be distracted by the cuteness of these animals. Remember, it's a quiz. You need to be in it to win it. Who learns to climb first? Black bear or panda? Okay, question four. Who learns to fly first? Is it an albatross or a barn owl? That's question four, who learns to fly first? The albatross or the barn owl? Number five, so who changes color first? So these are animals who are born one color and then as they get older, they change color. So who changes color first? Is it the flamingo or the Javan langur monkey? So flamingos, as most of you will know, go pink at some point, and the Javan langur monkey goes black. So they're born with this lovely orange color, but then they, uh, then they go black. But who changes color first? Flamingo or the Javan langur monkey? Glad you're enjoying the maned wolf, Ben Collier. Very good. I think Google's gonna explode with uh, animal searchings this evening. Yes. Okay, question six. Who learns to swim first? Is it a seal or a duck? That is question six. Who learns to swim first, a seal or a duck? Okay, question seven. Who learns to hunt first? Is it a wolf or a fox? So that's question seven. Who learns to hunt first, a wolf or a fox? Okay, question eight. Who spends longer inside mama? The camel or the great white shark? So because this is around about babies, I'm wondering who spends longer inside mama? Rather than the question, who has the longest gestation period? <laughs> so who spends longer inside mom? Camel or great white shark? Okay, question nine, who lays eggs first? Chicken or a python? So both of these animals lay eggs. But who lays them first? Is it a chicken or a python? And finally, question 10, who leaves home first? So 
who becomes independent? Is it the orangutan or the penguin? So question 10, who leaves home first and becomes independent? Is it the orangutan or the penguin? Okay, I'm gonna give you two minutes to decide um, and maybe grab a quick drink. Then we're gonna do the answers and go into our speed round. So I'll see you in two minutes. Okay, everyone, time's up. Try Time to go through those answers and see the cute things about these animals. So, without further ado, question one. I asked you who was smaller when they were born, and the answer, maybe surprisingly, is the kangaroo. So, um, when a dolphin is born, a common bottlenose dolphin calf is typically 39 to 53 inches long, but a kangaroo can be as small as a grain of rice. So they're super teeny tiny. So that's one in someone's hand for scale. So kangaroo. Uh, question two, I want to know who learns to walk first. And it uh, is a giraffe, not by much. So this is not quite close. So uh, within half an hour of being born, uh, giraffes will usually be able to stand and walk. Uh, they need to do that so they can nurse from their mum who is up very high. Uh, within the first day, giraffes will also be able to run. Animals, uh, elephants aren't far behind, so they can um, stand and walk within an hour. So it is close, but giraffes are first. I asked you who learns to climb first. The answer is a black bear. Uh, so black bears can pretty much climb almost immediately. Um, whereas pandas learn at about five months old. So they're quite far behind on that one. So black bear is the correct answer. As to who learns to fly first, the correct answer to this is the barn owl. So barn owls um, learn to fly around eight to nine weeks. Um, whereas the albatross can take up to 40 weeks. So absolutely ages that's with a uh, great albatrosses so barn owl wins that one by a long way question five i asked you who changes color first the answer is the javan langur monkey uh, so uh, flamingos uh, they will they are born gray and then they go pink within a couple of years that's to do with the food they eat um containing uh 
organic chemicals with reddish orange pigment. Um, and the Java and Langer monkey, you'll see this little baby one's next to its parent there. They're born orange and they go black within about six months. So uh, it's said that at birth, the monkeys are apricot orange to ensure that they are the center of attention for the group. So that's pretty, pretty clever. Uh, question six, who learns to swim first? It is a seal. Uh, the seals, uh, those pups can swim almost immediately after birth. And by the time they're two days old, they can actually hold their breath underwater for two whole minutes, which is pretty impressive. Uh, these uh, ducklings, they're born with yellow fuzz, and so they can't swim until their feathers come in, which is around eight to 10 weeks. So seal wins that one. Question seven, who learns to hunt first? It is the fox. So the fox, um, they take about three months to learn to hunt. Um, so they sort of go off by themselves, but wolves take three, sorry, six to eight months. So that's when they start to travel with the pack and join the hunts. Question eight, who spends longer inside mama? So a camel spends longer. So camels have a gestation period of 13 to 15 months. Um, uh, but the, the great white shark, so it's not much of a difference here. Great white sharks uh, are in gestation for 12 months. Although some sharks can have a gestation period of three years, which is insane. Um, I didn't mention an elephant in this question because I thought that'd be too easy because uh, elephants um, are well known to have a really long pregnancy. So they have like a 22 month pregnancy, which is the longest gestation period of any mammal. Right, question nine, I asked who lays eggs first? It's probably not a surprise, this is the chicken. So the chicken, um, they lay their first egg around 18 weeks old and then lay an egg up to each day subject to their breed environment and the individual bird. Uh, whereas uh, a female python uh, should be at least 1200 grams before breeding, uh, which they reach between about two and three years of age. And finally, who leaves home first becomes independent. So by quite a long way, penguins leave home first. So when they're about seven to nine weeks old, um, penguins can leave the colony and go to sea. Whereas an orangutan, they take a really long time to mature. Maybe you quite like people. So it can take up to eight years for a baby orangutan to be weaned from its mum. So they are pretty needy. Okay, so total up your scores. So from round one, two, and three, you'll have points out of 10 for each one. We sent you a link in the chat. So I need you to click on that. You'll put in your team name at the top. Then put in your score out of 10 for round one, then separately round two, then separately round three. And I also am asking you how many times you saw a picture of my dog. As you remember, you get a bonus point if you get that one right. So fill that in um, because we're gonna begin the speed round in just a second and it is speedy. So you wanna be on your game. So while you're filling in, those forms, I will give you the rules of the speed round. So every answer in the speed round is worth two points, unlike the other rounds, which are just worth one. So if maybe you didn't do so well in one of the rounds, this is the one where you can run to the top. So each question will only be read once. So you need to listen really carefully. I won't say it again. Then, once I've read all the questions, you will have 10 seconds to submit your answers. That's not very long. The first team to submit their answers will get two bonus points if you're the fastest. And the second team to submit their answers will get one bonus point. Remember, there is also that bonus point for telling me how many pictures of my dog you saw. Okay, so hopefully you are all ready to go. It is pretty fast. Ready, steady, here we go. Question one, which of these animals cannot swim? Is it A, hippopotamus, B, jaguar, or C, rhinoceros? Question two, which of these is not a breed of shark? Is it A, Christmas shark, B, cookie cutter shark, or C, goblin shark? 
Question three, what are these bits on an orangutan called? Is it A, phalanges, B, flappies, or C, hangers? Question four, the word jaguar comes from the indigenous word yaguar, which means he who kills with one what? A, bite, B, leap, or C, scratch. Question five, what is the name of the dance honeybees do to communicate? Is it A, shuffle dance, B, waggle dance, or C, wiggle dance? Question six, complete the song lyric. Who let the what out? A, cats, B, dogs, or C, whales? Question seven, which of these is a legitimate term for a polar bear grizzly bear hybrid? A, grizzlar bear, B, poser bear, or C, pizzly bear? Question eight, three days before Snakes on a Plane was released, another horror film went direct to video. What is the name of that film? The A, Snakes on the Brain. B, snakes are insane, or C, snakes on a train. Question nine, in The Lion King, leading lion Scar relies on three main hyenas. Two of them are Shenzi and Banzai. Who is the third? Is it A, Ed, B, Fred, or C, Ted? Question 10, the mighty Hercules beetle can comfortably move 30 times its body weight. How many of them would it take to pull a one kilogram bag of flour from one side of a room to the other? The A, one, B, 10, or C, 100. Okay, you now have 10 seconds. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. It was pretty speedy, wasn't it? So now it's closed. You better have submitted your answers. I told you it was fast. So while my team is uh, frantically adding up all of your scores, which I will then show to you shortly on a scoreboard so we can crown our winner. I will go through our answers and all the little bits of knowledge that I picked up along the way. So question one, I asked you, which of these animals cannot swim? And it is perhaps surprisingly the hippopotamus. So they do this sort of weird running thing they, they, they're so heavy that they just sink and then they kind of run along the bottom of a lake or whatever and then jump up. Uh, you can have a look on, on YouTube. There's a really amazing um, uh, hippopotamus sort of bursting out of the water and it's super fast. So they're charging and then they explode out of the water. So question two, I asked you, which of these is not a breed of shark? And the one that I made up, was Christmas shark that is not not a shark at all um, if you're interested the other sharks so this is a goblin shark um, probably quite easy to see why it's called a goblin shark and then this is the cookie cutter shark um, so the name cookie cutter shark refers to its feeding habit of gouging um, as if cutting out with a cookie cutter uh, larger animals so their marks will be left on other marine mammals and fishes, and they've also been found on submarines, uh, cables, and even human bodies. So cookie cutter shark. Right, question three, I asked you, what are these bits on an orangutan called? So they are called phalanges, or maybe flanges. I quite like flanges. So uh, as um, some adult male orangutans get older, they might develop these flaps of fatty tissue on the sides of their face. They develop this when they're fully mature, uh, when they were around 35 years old. So this is uh, a male orangutan without that. So you can just see how, how different that is. Okay, question four, I asked you um, in the word, ja the word jaguar means 
what he who kills with one leap is the answer he who kills with one leap question five i asked you what is the name of the dance that honeybees do to communicate this is the waggle dance um you can learn more about the waggle dance if you like uh, by joining our imperial late yoga class which is tomorrow lunchtime so um ellie's going to be posting a link to that in the chat uh, the waggle dance is fascinating um, they use this uh, to tell their nest mates where to go to find the best source of food. It takes a while to decode this dance. So yes, have, check out the, uh, the link to the yoga class tomorrow, inspired by, by the waggle dance. Okay, question six, I asked you to complete the song lyric, who let the whales out? No, just kidding, it's dogs. Question seven, uh, I want to know which one of these uh, was a legitimate term for the polar bear grizzly bear hybrid, which is a thing. So you can call them pizzly bears. So um, in 2006, genetic testing confirmed that these animals exist. So you can also call them growler bears. Um, so this is a picture that I found of one of these hybrids. Um, it, is apparently uh, unsurprising to some scientists because polar bears evolved from brown bears around 150,000 years ago. So there you go. All right, question eight. Uh, three days before Snakes on a Plane was released, another horror film went direct to video. I want to know the name of the film. And the name of the film was Snakes on a Train. This is the incredible uh, poster which rated 18% on Rotten Tomatoes sort of about um, a woman who's been on a curse. She's had a curse put on her and snake eggs hatch. I assume at some point the snake swallows the train. Anyway, there you go. Maybe it's worth a watch, maybe not. <laughs> okay, question nine. I want to know who was the third hyena. So this is of course Ed, but just in case I get sued by Disney, I'm not gonna show you a picture of the actual character, just that little sort of stick drawing of a hyena there. And question 10, uh, so there's this beetle called a Hercules beetle um, who can comfortably move 30 times its body weight. So to pull a one kilogram bag of flour, it would actually only take one, one beetle. They used to be considered the strongest animal on earth because uh, they can lift so many times uh, their body weight. But there are, um, actually a few other beetles since then who have passed it so the dung beetle can lift a lot more um so just to give you an idea these they're just so big, big and terrifying so that's to give you an idea of scale um okay i want to know if you spotted the dog so uh we had the first one at the very beginning of the quiz then this one popped up so that's two three four five and six there were six pictures of my beautiful dog rihanna so uh, anyone who got that six uh, gets a bonus point so um now we're gonna have a look at the final scores so i'm gonna ask my wonderful colleague um to bring up these for me so i'm just gonna take away this maybe you can have a look at my face for the moment um okay here we go so final scores let's see what we have okay so the the lowest score that people got was 21 that's very good so 20 teams we have that's fantastic thank you for joining so roy division uh very honorable last place there uh then we've got fat pancakes thanks for joining us brank covidians very topical Bzz, nice pinky and the brain in 16th place and we've got the lion cheetahs is that a thing uh the dilly boys gin and topic very good. Billy's Babies, from what I can tell, is that some kind of in-joke? I'm not sure. Um, the Wee Donkey, uh, next. And then in 10th place, Quiz Tina Aguilera, that's a classic quiz name, very good. Um, in ninth place, we've got the Daniels Family. Eighth place, the David Battenboroughs, I'm enjoying that. Uh, seventh place, F1 Roro, very good. Yeah, we're getting great scores here. And as that was 34 points, also joint with the brightest stars. Uh, then fun and games. Then fourth place, the quizicists. I assume you're also scientists as well. And then in the top three, we've got 
in third place with 36 points. Anthrophora plumbipes in my chimney. Very good, 36 points. Uh, then in second place with 38 points, we have the South Coast Quizzers. And in first place with 40 points, the Friends of Florence. Well done. Great job, everybody. There's some great scores there as well. Maybe I made this a little bit too easy, but you know, we all love animals. So uh, great. Thank you so much for joining. So I uh, really appreciate you coming along to the quiz. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, this is the last of our Imperial Lates for a while. So you won't see me um, uh, very soon, but you can browse all our events from all of the previous Lates. Uh, to your heart's content. So Ellie will be posting a link in the chat for you, so you can go and check that out. Um, you can, uh, you know, look at all the details from everything we've done and follow us as well on Imperial Spark on Twitter. We'd also really appreciate you telling us what you thought of tonight's quiz. It helps us um, for future events. So a link is going to be put in the chat any second now. And I'll just bring Ben back onto screen to say thank you so much for sharing your research with us and uh, just being such a great sport. So um, last thing, just thank you to everyone and uh, share what you've learned, laugh about what you didn't know, and thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.